These notes are about bacteria. Uh, this is covered in chapter 16 of your book uh, about prokaryotes. We've talked about prokaryotes in the past several different times. Uh, this slide shows basically pictures of bacteria, the three different main bacterial shapes. The coccus or the spherical vir uh, bacterium, the bacillus which is rod shaped, and then the spirillum which is helical or, or spiral shaped. So remember we talked about there are two domains of bacteria, the bacteria and the archaea. The bacteria, this shows the comparison of the two, the differences between them. The RNA sequences are different between the bacteria and the archaea. There's one kind of RNA polymerase as opposed to several kinds here. There are no introns present in the bacteria, but there are in archaea. The growth is inhibited by antibiotics and not in archaea. They have peptidoglycan in their cell walls, which archaea do not have, and there are no histones in the DNA in the bacteria, but they are in the archaea. We're going to focus mostly on the bacteria because these are the ones that are most widely studied and the ones we mostly come in contact with. Uh, they both probably evolved from a universal ancestor, but there was a, the eubacteria went a different direction than the archaea and the eukarya. There were, probably was a common ancestor from those. So what do colonies look like? When you see them on petri dishes, this is what you see. These circular, circular areas are colonies of different kinds. Sometimes they kind of run together. They can, you can identify them sometimes by their color, by their shape, by the type of margin they have, whether they spread out or whether they're uh, uh, bunch up together. Here you have some molds along with some bacteria here. Different kinds of things that you see in the lab. This uh, red auger here is called blood auger, and oftentimes that's used to see whether there is hemolytic action uh, produced by the bacteria. So usually there are about 1 to 5 microns or micrometers in diameter, and eukaryote cells are about 10 to 100 micrometers in diameter, so they're a lot smaller. And if you, this is a scale just to show you kind of the difference between human skin cells and then a blood cell and then a staph cell. So there's a big difference in size uh, in the bacteria as compared to uh, eukaryotic cells in general. The three shapes are the coccus, which is spherical, the bacillus, which is a rod, and the spirochete, which is a spiral. Okay, uh, Streptococcus and Staphylococcus are, are made of the, of the uh, coccus shape. The Staphylo refers to a cluster, like a, like a cluster of grapes. The Strepto refers to a chain, like you see here. The bacilli are rod-shaped. Usually they're singular, although they can occur in pairs or in chains. So we have sometimes Diplobacillus and Streptobacillus there. And then the, the spiral um, the spirilla ones, the spirochetes, are usually singular. Um, they are not as common as the other two. An example of one for this is uh, the the disease. I mean, I mean the the um, the, the bacterium uh, Treponema pallidum, which causes syphilis. Here's a giant generalized bacterial cell. We have labeled a cell like this before, just as a review. We have the, the nucleoid region, which contains the chromosome, the single chromosome. We've got the cytoplasm with ribosomes present in it. We've got the cell membrane and the cell wall, the, the, pl the flagellum, which is for movement. We have the pili, which are the hair-like projections that allow for, for uh, attachment to surfaces. Um, We've got uh, sometimes a, a capsule or a slime layer on the outside of the cell wall there, and, um, and the plasmid, which is a separate ring of DNA. So external structures, we have a capsule, which is a sticky layer that allows bacteria to adhere to a surface or others in a colony. All bacteria don't have capsules. Some of them do, some of them do not. Flagella, which is a structure that allows them to move around. Uh, they can have one flagellum, or they can have many flagella. Uh, or they can have no flagella at all. Fembrae A, which are hair-like projections that allow them to attach to surfaces, and pili, which are short extensions that allow them to attach and hold groups in place. And there are also some pili that allow them to exchange those plasmids with each other. Um, cell walls come in two basic kinds in the kingdom uh, in domain U bacteria or domain bacteria, kingdom U bacteria, gram positive and gram negative are the two main types. The gram positive ones you see in blue or purple over here, they have simple cell walls with a relatively thick layer of peptidoglycan, which allows them to stain purple under this gram stain process is commonly used in laboratories. The gram negative ones have a more complex cell wall with less peptidoglycan and they stain pink. These are, uh, they're both, they both can be harmful to you. Um, it says here that the gram-negative ones are more threatening and often toxic, but the gram-positive ones include things like staph and, staph and strep, so they can be very harmful as well. 
Here we see a couple of, here's a bacterium the attaching to a tonsil cell here, and the capsule allows it to stick to and attach to that cell. And here we have the fimbrae and the flagella, showing the fimbrae as being a little bit longer than the pili, but sh much shorter than the flagella, and they're not equipped for movement the way the flagella are. So features and adaptations that you find in various kinds of bacteria. Most prokaryotes can replicate within one to three hours. It doesn't take a whole long time for them to grow into large numbers. In 24 hours, you can go from one cell to millions of cells. The genome that's of the, um, of the bacterium is one circular chromosome. And then uh, it's gonna, there have been a lot of variations because it can easily mutate because there's only that one chromosome. A plasmid is a second circular piece of DNA which replicates independently of the genome of the bacterium. And this oftentimes carries genes to enhance survival. One of the genes that's very often found on a plasmid is resistance to antibiotics. And then bacteria can also, some bacteria can also produce endospores, which can withstand harsh conditions. And basically this is just they kind of wall off a portion of the cell with a very thick wall that containing small amount of cytoplasm in the genome. And it can withstand uh, lots of harsh conditions, um, dryness, high temperature, low temperature, and survive sometimes for many, many years in a kind of an inactive state before it comes in contact with moisture and nutrients that allow it to start growing again. Here's Bacillus anthracis. This is the the, the organism that produces uh, anthrax, and it, you see the clear areas here are are the endospores. This is one. This is what makes anthrax so dangerous um, because it can produce these very resistant spores that can last for a very long time in a very dry condition and then become reactivated very easily. Um, here we see a couple of other pictures. This shows how much DNA is released from a ruptured cell. You can see there's lot, even though there's only one chromosome, there's a lot of it there. But then you have a couple of separate pieces, those plasmids. And then this shows an endospore. We see the several walls around this resistant area here that can exist, resist um, drying out and can survive for very long periods of time. Bacteria produced by binary fission most of the time. This is basically a cloning process. The, the DNA is replicated here. Then notice the two um, chromosomes attached to the internal, uh, to the plasma membrane. And as the cell continues to grow, the cell wall and the plasma membrane begin to divide here in a form of cytokinesis. A cross wall forms between them and separates them into two separate cells. Okay, here you can see a picture, a photograph of a bacteria that is, that is in the process of dividing. Um, that's the main kind of cell division. That's asexual cell division, binary fission. Uh, there's also sexual reproduction where you have some recombination of genes. It's not really sexual reproduction as we would think of it, but it does involve recombination of genes. And there are three main types of this. There's transformation, when the uh, DNA can be uh, taken up from another source, such as from a plasmid uh, from another bacterium. And this is important. We use this in, in uh, DNA experimentation, genetic engineering. We'll, we'll talk more about this later on as we get into talking about biotechnology. But this is commonly used for a lot of things these days uh, as far as making uh, necessary and needed products using bacteria as a, as a source to make those things. Transduction is when you have genes that are accidentally transported by a bacteriophage. When that bacteriophage DNA separates from the um, bacterial DNA, sometimes it'll pick up genes uh, from the, from the bacterium as well that add to the, the viral DNA. And then when it uh, uh, infects another bacterial cell, then those bacterial genes can be transfer transferred as well in the process of transduction. And then finally, we have conjugation. And this is when you can have the exchange of genetic information between two genetically different cells by means of transferring that plasmid from one to the other. Um, here we have transformation, where you have the donor cell producing uh, DNA that can be picked up by the recipient cell here. Transduction, which is when you have that bacterial DNA that's being transferred by the bacteriophage. And then conjugation, where you have two cells that join together and they, the pl plasmid is transferred from one to the other. Now, 
uh, with bacteria, you've got to talk about their metabolic relationships and, and how they work with oxygen. There are some bacteria that are obligate aerobes. That means they require free oxygen. They have to live in the presence of oxygen. There are others that are called facultative anaerobes. They can use oxygen if oxygen is present, but if oxygen is not present, they can use fermentation to get some more energy. And then they're the ones that are obligate anaerobes, and these are poisoned by the presence of oxygen. And they use fermentation or anaerobic respiration of another type to produce their energy. Why are bacteria important? The vast majority of bacteria are either helpful or benign to us. Only about 2% are pathogenic. Uh, so they're very important for decomposers, recycling nutrients from dead material. They are natural inhabitants of your intestines. Uh, like E. coli that assist in your uh, digestive process. There are nitrogen fixers in the soil that uh, lead to soil fertility. Uh, eukaryotic organisms cannot use nitrogen gas directly. It has to be in the form of compounds and they need nitrogen to make their proteins and their nucleic acids. And so there are special bacteria that live in the soil that actually can use the atmospheric nitrogen and tr convert it into nitrates, which can then fertilize the soil for the plants to pick up those as nutrients. Bacteria are also useful in genetic engineering to produce um, to produce products uh, that we need, um, like insulin can be produced by bacteria uh, very inexpensively. Uh, there are some bacteria also that are pathogenic uh, that cause disease, and then some are soil bacteria that are just that produce antibiotics. Pathogens are agents which cause disease, and we often think about bacteria as being pathogens, and a lot of pathogens are bacteria, but they can also be viruses or even protista uh, from time to time. But uh, we will talk mostly about them in terms of bacteria, and we're talking about now the germ theory of disease. That is that the disease is caused by microorganisms. Here you have two different ones that cause diseases in humans, Staphylococcus aureus, which causes staph infections, and Treponema pallidum, which produces syphilis. It's, it's one of this, this little spiral black thing here. It's found inside that cell culture. Antibiotics are drugs that kill infectious organisms. Now, they don't kill viruses. They only kill bacteria. Um, some kill fungi as well. Many of the antibiotics that we have today target the ribosomes and the bacteria that make the proteins that are found in the cell walls. And if the, if the uh, bacteria can't make new cell walls, then they can't grow. And if they can't grow, they will die. Um, the source of antibiotics are either certain fungi or soil bacteria that produce these substances naturally uh, that can kill bacteria. Some bacteria develop a resistance to an antibiotic. This is called antibiotic resistance, and they can survive exposure. Um, this is why it's really important for you when you, are, when you are prescribed an antibiotic to take the whole dosage that is prescribed rather than stopping when you start feeling better because that will hopefully kill off all the bacteria rather than leaving some that might be somewhat resistant to that antibiotic that can then grow and pass on their resistance to other bacteria. Uh, most bacteria produce toxins to make you sick. There are exotoxins and endotoxins. Exotoxins are ones that are secreted into the environment like Staph aureus uh, does this when it makes you sick. And then there are endotoxins which affect the lipid components of the membrane. Uh, that's something like salmonella that causes food poisoning. Here we see some bacteria. The, the background here on this Petri dish is a lawn of bacteria, and, the, and then these little disks here have antibiotic, or uh, different kinds of antibiotic there, and the clear zones around them are called zones of inhibition. And this is the way you would determine which antibiotic would work the best for that particular an infection. Um, Koch's postulates are uh, a series of rules to figure out which bacterium causes which disease. And there are four basic steps in Koch's postulates. The pathogen must be found in the sick organism and not a well one. That uh, pathogen can be isolated and grown in pure culture where you get only that cell. The cultured pathogen that can then be transmitted to a healthy host, producing the same symptoms in the host as it gets sick. And then you can re-isolate that pathogen from that host and find that it's identical to the original uh, pathogen. A vaccine is an inactive form of a bacteria or a virus that can stimulate your immune system uh, to produce antibodies uh, against the pathogen. And that will help protect you against future infection from that disease. Uh, we take vaccines all the time, flu and polio and, and various other, other uh, 
illnesses like that, and they're very, very useful uh, in, helping in helping prevent infection. One really important thing to, to remember about vaccines and antibiotics is that antibiotics cannot treat viral diseases, only bacterial diseases, and that viral diseases, can you can treat the symptoms and you can have a vaccine that prevents it, but, you, but there's not really a treatment for the virus itself. Um, so antibiotics don't work on viral infections, mostly because viruses don't have cell walls and they don't have ribosomes that make the cell wall components for them to affect because most antibiotics, as we said earlier, uh, affect the formation of new cell walls. Hoax postulates don't work on viruses because you have to be able to grow that pathogen in a pure culture that has nothing else, and viruses can only grow and reproduce inside living cells. So you would always have a living cell that would be in included there as well as the virus. The nitrogen cycle is the, uh, the passage of nitrogen from the air through those nitrogen-fixing bacteria into plants. And um, this is necessary to, because, again, eukaryotes can't use uh, nitrogen gas. They can only use nitrogen in the form of compounds. And, uh, but, but it's necessary. It's one of the four main um, elements that must be present in all living things. And so you have to have um, a source of of nitrogen that can be used. And so uh, you can actually make a nitrogen cycle. And we'll talk more about this cycle when we talk about ecology later on. So what about if we did not have bacteria in our world? What would happen to the sewage that we have? Well, it would be kind of difficult to do anything with the sewage because bacteria, as decomposers, help break down and recycle the nutrients that are left over in the sewage. Um, if you didn't have bacteria uh, around, then plants wouldn't be able to grow because they wouldn't be able to get the nitrates that uh, allow them to grow and make proteins and nucleic acids because the plants have to get their nitrogen from compounds produced by the nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Um, bacteria also can be, there are some bacteria that produce methane where they can help break methane down. And so it would have a big effect on the world in general. And this concludes the notes on bacteria.